Hello, everyone. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Uh, we are taking a few minutes to have everyone join in. So please be patient with us. Wait a few seconds uh, until a lot of the participants are in. We want to wait um, to have everyone in their seats before we start. So if you're just joining us, we are having a small wait period for all of the participants to attendees to get in. Um, we will wait another 30 seconds or so, and then we will begin. Um, so if you are worried that nothing's happening, it's because nothing is happening yet. Okay, so I am hoping that this is um, enough wait time for us to start our uh, seminar, our chat, our talk today. So, hola, bienvenidos. Um, welcome, this is uh, the first CLABS event that uh, we organized in a series of virtual events that CLABS is going to organize um, CLAPS is the Center for Latin American and Border Studies at New Mexico State University. My name is David Ortiz, and I am the inaugural faculty fellow for CLAPS, and I'm gonna be the moderator for today's panel. Um, CLAPS has an extensive and important history of scholarship at NMSU, and I am honored to be in the position to lead and continue this scholarly efforts uh, at, at this uh, great center. Um, Please follow us on Twitter, on Facebook and Instagram or join our mailing list through our website so that we can keep you informed of all the exciting events we will be organizing next semester and in the future. Those will be uh, appearing um, in your chat box right now. So if you want to follow us, that's the way to do it. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists today and all of you for being here at this event today. We have uh, we actually had more than 150, almost 160 registrants uh, for this event. So we are very happy that, that you're here and in attendance from uh, NMSU, from our El Paso, Las Cruces, Ciudad Juarez community, uh, from all across the US and even some countries in Latin America. So again, muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Thank you all for making it in these uh, difficult and demanding times. Um, this event is uh, uh, co-sponsored by the Beyond Borders Community of Practice that is led by Dr. Chris Brown, who is joining us today. And I wanna give him a few uh, minutes to talk about what this uh, community of practice is here at NMSU, Chris. Thank you very much, David. I'd like to extend my thanks to our panelists, to the support person that we have from NMSU and to Yvette and David for putting this together. This is our first inaugural event between the two initiatives. Center for Latin American Border Studies is reasonably well-defined and recognized. It has a rich heritage of 40 years. David's got a great start to reinvigorating it. The Beyond Borders Community of Practice is basically an experiment that Provost Carol Parker has launched um, by naming me as the inaugural fellow. And David and I are working together to reboot collabs and to boot up a community of practice that looks at borders around the world across different elements. And with that, I'm honored to co-host this, but I'd like to make sure that all of the credit goes to David and his team. And with that, I'll stand down and I very much look forward to our speakers. And I thank everyone again for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, this event uh, is also sponsored by the Office of the Provost who, as Chris mentioned, has fueled these two initiatives, the Center for Latin American Border Studies and the Beyond Borders Community of Practice as an essential part of the scholarly endeavors at the Borderlands University, such as NMSU. So uh, the Provost could not join us today, but she did send a message for me to read to all of you. So I will, I will do that right now. Uh, Provost Parker, Parker says, 
On behalf of the academic leadership and administration at NMSU, welcome to this colloquium featuring the work of Dr. Neil Harvey, Ms. Ava McElhone Yates, and Ms. Seira Martin. I would like to thank you and thank the organizers, sponsors, and presenters and participants for coming together in support of this event today. Understandably, there is much attention right now on domestic matters and challenges, but we must not allow our domestic challenges to cause us to lose sight of the circumstances, policies, and challenges of our neighbors to the South. We are truly all one community in this region. At this time in our lives, it is more important than ever that we promote and share the work of our presenters and the work that they're undertaking. NMSU must be engaged and supportive of those impacted by these circumstances and to work to remedy wrongs when they occur, especially if, as a if it is a consequence of government action, just as today's presenters are doing. I am especially pleased to feature the work of undergraduate students, which was supportive of by an NSF grant. Also, as you may know, this is the inaugural event of the venerable and recently repositioned Center for Latin American and Border Studies here at NMSU. Following my arrival at NMSU a little more than a year ago, I, made with, I met with CLAP supporters and we chartered a new path forward for the center. Under the leadership of Dr. David Ortiz in his role as my faculty fellow for CLABS, we will be supporting and highlighting research and scholarship focused on the border region and, and Latin America. I hope that those of you in attendance will consider actively participating in future CLABS events and activities. Please enjoy the presentation. Uh, thank you uh, to Dr. Parker for sending us those words. Uh, one final thing before I... Uh, introduce our panelists. Note please that at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button or wherever you have your bar in Zoom, there's a Q&A button. If you click on that, that will be the way to let us know what kinds of questions you have for our panelists, where you can submit those questions to our panelists. We're gonna try to answer as many questions as possible, but we do have limited time. So hopefully we will get to yours. If we don't, we will hopefully get to the ones that are most requested. Okay, without further ado, uh, this presentation today is entitled Searching for Safety, Findings from a Community-Based Participatory Research Program for Undergraduate Students on Migrant Experiences of Detention, Removal, and Community Solidarity. And we have three panelists that I am very honored to present. First, Dr. Neil Harvey, who is a professor and head of the Department of Government at New Mexico State University. He mainly teaches in the subfield of comparative politics with a focus on Latin America, Mexico, and border issues. He has carried out extensive research on rural movements in Chiapas, Mexico, and is the author of many articles on the Zapatistas, as well as the book, The Chiapas Rebellion, The Struggle for Land and Democracy. Uh, he's the co-PI co-principal investigator, along with Dr. Jeremy Slack in our sister university at UTEP uh, of the NSF REU site program on immigration and policy and border communities. We are very honored to have him. Thank you, Neil. Um, we also have uh, Ms. Ava McElhone Yates. Ms. Ava McElhone Yates is a senior history major at Vassar College with a minor in Spanish. She serves as a coordinator for the Consortium of Forced Migration, Displacement and Education, who is, that is an Andrew Mellon Foundation funded initiative to develop a response from higher education institutions regarding forced migration and while creating a shared interdisciplinary curriculum. Ava has conducted research along the US-Mexico border in this NSF REU Immigration Policy and Border Communities Program. And there she studied US sanctuary city legislation conducted Know Your Rights programming for asylum seekers and participated in other border advocacy work. She is a member of the 2020 and 2021 Student Voices for Refugees Network Steering Committee and her work has appeared in Europe now. Finally, we have Ms. Saira Martin. Saira Martin is our very own senior at New Mexico State University. We're very proud uh, of her. Uh, she's double majoring in government and criminal justice with a minor in gender and sexuality studies. Saida grew up in Berino, New Mexico. She's uh, a resident of our region. And uh, she performed seasonal agricultural work through the Gadsden Valley, which helped her attend NMSU with the help of 
college uh, of the college assistant migrant program or camp. Uh, she now serves there as a research assistant, as an ambassador to other students uh, that are migrants that might want to attend NMSU. Okay, so without further ado, I will leave all of this to our participants, and uh, I think Dr. Neil Harvey will take this event away. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, thank you, Chris and Yvette, for putting this together. And also to our provost, uh, Dr. Carol Parker, for supporting this new era for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies uh, for the Cross Border Initiative. Um, it's really very timely, and we would agree with her that uh, currently a lot of our focus is on domestic politics, um, but we need to uh, um, keep uh, our eye and our attention on international issues and how they affect. Um, our communities, particularly in the border region. I'm going to upload a PowerPoint to, to take us through some of the main points and include some photographs from the project which um, we're talking about today. So as um, David mentioned, uh, this project is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's one of the many research experience for undergraduate site programs. And if anyone is interested in um, doing a program like this in the social sciences, then this is a great opportunity. I think uh, the, um, the way that this has come together has been a process for myself. Um, Actually, CLABS and the Nason House, where CLABS is housed here at the NMSU campus, was very important in that, in holding a series of meetings with colleagues from the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and at UTEP in El Paso in 2013, 14, 15. And out of that, I began work with Dr. Jeremy Slack at UTEP in putting together a proposal which uh, was successful in the second round. It's another thing to remember with these things. It usually takes a couple of stabs before you get the, the uh, support. But we're very grateful to the NSF for providing uh, support for this. Um, the rationale for this program was um, for us to try and develop what we're calling a human rights approach to immigration. And I think this came out of concern um, in the period that I referred to around 2012, 13, 14, largely with the failure of attempts at comprehensive immigration reform, while at the same time we saw an increase in funding for more border enforcement, including more funding for border agents. We didn't really see that as a solution. Certainly the root causes of migration weren't even being spoken about very much in policy circles. We felt that what was missing was a human rights angle to try and address immigration to the United States. The goals of the project are twofold, really, to train undergraduate students in research methods, but also to provide those same students with opportunities to conduct their own projects during a 10-week summer program. And the funding began in the summer of 2018 and continues at least until next summer and hopefully we'll be able to renew this for subsequent years. So the activities during those three summer programs include workshops conducted by uh, myself and by Dr. Slack and some of our uh, faculty here at UTEP and NMSU on different aspects of how to conduct qualitative, mainly qualitative uh, research, but also they set up, uh, what we do is set up projects that can be accomplished within the timeframe of those 10 weeks. And we work uh, closely with some of our community partners. The ACLU has an office here in Las Cruces, as well as one now in El Paso. We've also worked with the Border Network for Human Rights, the Hope Border Institute, which is based in El Paso. Last year, we worked with uh, NM Cafe or New Mexico Cafe, a local community organization promoting also immigrant rights. And this summer, um, we started work um, a group of us within the project online because it's impossible to do work right now with the pandemic, 
but with the um, Advocate Volunteers for Immigrants in Detention, or AVID. So we're a team of uh, PIs, myself and Dr. Slark, as I mentioned, are the two co-PIs and principal investigators on this. And we also have five faculty mentors or advisors, two at NMSU, Cynthia Bejarano and Sabina Hirschauer, and three professors from UTEP, Joe Hyman, Gina Nunez, and Cristina Morales. And those advisors work with two students that paired up during the summer to give them some guidance, orientation, and feedback on their work as they go. And the results, are, as NSF often uh, will stress, uh, they want to see new knowledge being created out of this, but also, which is very important, I think, for the social scientists to remember the societal benefits of the work of how does this help our society meet the goals and the challenges and the dilemmas that we all face. I'll start with a couple of photographs um, to show you um, this is just from the 2018 group where we attended a workshop at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at UTEP. And this was a workshop given on um, qualitative research and collecting life histories. And it was given by Dr. Alfonso Herrera Robles, who's a professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez. So one of the other things we've tried to include as much as possible is um, input from our colleagues in Ciudad Juarez, both in the academic scene and also amongst the local community organizations there. Um, this is a photograph of one of the students in the first year in 2018, Mariana Marañón, who recently graduated from government at NMSU, presenting at a regional organization, the Midwest Latin American Studies Association, uh, some results from her work are following court proceedings and the legal representation or lack thereof of undocumented migrants in El Paso's federal court. And this is a photograph from the same conference. There you can see one of our speakers today, Zaira Martin, who's third from the left, along with Carlos Espina, another student from Vassar College in New York, where Ava, one of our other speakers today, is from. Mariana Marañón and Sandra Dominguez from UTEP. So one of the things we've been doing is presenting our work at regional conferences and it's, I think it's a good experience and students, the students may reflect on that in a moment. Um, let me give some background though, because the question comes up, well, what is the rationale? What is the problem that we're trying to address? And I think it could be summed up with one word which has recently been coined in some of the academic literature. And I think that is crimigration. It combines the notion of criminality with immigration. Some scholars use this as a way of trying to get it. How did that happen? How has it become possible that we see in political discourse and also in the institutions and practices more and more uh, an almost natural association between immigration and criminality? It certainly served in the um, the campaign of now President Trump, um, when he began his campaign, his, his very first speech, clearly made that linkage and it resonated. So it's an important question of how that came about and what may be done in order to address immigration from a human rights perspective from rather than assuming criminality. Um, going up some of the recent scholarship and one source I would recommend for everybody is the uh, Journal of Migration and Human Security, which is published by the Center for Migration Studies in New York. Um, this is from, some of these points I've taken from an article published a couple of years ago, which one of the co-authors was Dr. Jeremy Slack, my co-PI on this. But what we've seen uh, is that this association of criminality and immigration has been going on a while now. It's not something that began with this particular administration right now, it goes back at least until the 1980s when we see an increase in both anti-immigrant discourse and all those, this notion of legal violence that some scholars refer to in which um, migrants are placed in very harsh conditions in detention centers or are just pushed into desert regions in order to attempt to make crossings this certainly was the case in the early 90s we saw with the establishment of Operation Blockade 
in El Paso and Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego. And those efforts were an attempt to deter migration through what were then the most common areas of passage, the urban areas of El Paso, Juarez, or San Diego, Tijuana. Um, one of the effects of that is, as we've known um, with great um, uh, uh, negative effects, has been to push migrants into very inhospitable areas. The legal, on the legal legislation side, in 1996, the federal government passed the IIRIRA, which is a policy, a set of policies which really expanded the term of who constitutes a criminal alien. So it started to include such things as misdemeanors, um, nonviolent crimes, categories of, um, of crimes that come under, um, uh, for example, uh, minor traffic offenses. And it's this constant association of an immigrant community committing crimes that begins to gain some traction amongst legislators, the media, and so on. Um, during the 1990s then and the 2000s, particularly after September the 11th and the increasing, um, increasing focus on border security, um, we see a push to increase local police and federal immigration enforcement through the 278G agreements and, and later secure communities as a policy. And this, um, along with the expansion of who constitutes a criminal and what makes somebody a criminal alien and up for deportation, the expansion of that rapid expansion of that category, being assisted then by the use of local police, um, not everywhere, of course, there's a lot of resistance and still is to that. But given that immigration policy is a federal um, part of the legislation and the federal responsibility, um, local police have often said, well, we have enough on our plate and we're not going to get involved in this. It will destroy community trust and so on. But in those cases where it did happen, it did increase the number of people who were being detained for deportation. That was partially toned down a little and, uh, in the last couple of years of the Obama administration when the Priority Enforcement Program, PEP, came into place, um, which required that local um, jurisdictions focus solely on um, immigrants with very serious violent criminal histories rather than the vast majority who lack such uh, a background. Another aspect which came out of the crimmigration process was something called Operation Streamline, which Zyra observed and we'll be talking about soon, um, which is a way of speeding up the processing of undocumented migrants, those that have been crossed for the first time and those who had um, re-entered uh, re -entered the country after being deported. Um, and the scene of this is often, if you're able to observe at the federal immigration court, at the federal courts, are groups of what look like shackled prisoners. Uh, people brought in in five, six or more groups, shackled at the hands and waist and, and, and legs um, in processes in which they really understand or very rarely understand what the proceedings entail and what kinds of rights they may be giving up in the process. Zyra worked with two other students, Kelly Cortez from UCLA and Miriam Lopez from the University of Arizona in the summer 2018 in documenting Operation Streamline. So I'll let her talk more about that in a moment. Um, generally what we've seen, I think, with crew immigration is the use of detention where we end up with more and more uh, undocumented migrants and now asylum seekers being held and um, using the detention mode as also as an attempt to deter further immigration. Um, much of this has been ratcheted up, I think, uh, um, during the past few years, during the administration of President Trump, the executive order in his first couple of weeks in office in January 2017 led to subsequent ICE raids. And the key point there was that executive order really ended the Priority Enforcement Protocol, or PEP, um, made any undocumented immigrant in the country a priority for detention and removal, rather than 
focusing on what were deemed to be the more violent or most dangerous. We also saw a push for local police and ICE collaborations and attempt to uh, remove sanctuary policies and Ava will be talking about the sanctuary policy issue in a moment. Um, and this ratcheted up particularly in the uh, early or mid part of 2018 when former Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced a policy of zero tolerance which led immediately to the separation of children from families in which many children have been kept in cages. Um, this has been uh, the source of a national outcry and some may argue it was also a factor in the uh, vote for Democratic candidates in the midterm elections in November of 2018 and that this was not something that voters were uh, going to support. In 2019, we saw yet another layer to this known as the Migrant Protection Protocols or the Remain in Mexico policy in which asylum seekers, the vast majority from Central American countries, uh, were not allowed to stay and wait for a hearing in the United States, but have instead been returned to the Mexican side of the border to very precarious and violent conditions in cities such as Ciudad Juarez um, to wait for an eventual day to have their cases heard. This was also observed by students during the summer of 2019. And in uh, 2020, we know it, all of this continues, but on top, yet another layer of problems, and that is the impacts of COVID-19 in detention centers, particularly in the transferring of detainees between centers and how that affects the increase in, 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 um, in uh, the prevalence of COVID-19. And related to that, I think, is just the general earlier, longer term lack of sufficient attention to um, basic health care and sanitation in ICE detention centers, many of which are run for profit, in, in which those services are not um, meeting standards, even the government's own, or ICE's own standards in its performance-based national standards documents. Um, suffering then may be seen uh, quite cruelly as a deterrent strategy. One of our other students, Carlos Espina, also at Vasa College, um, wrote a paper which actually won the best student paper award at the Western Social Science Association meeting in 2019, arguing this, and it was based on the testimonies that he was able to gather from um, people seeking or fleeing violence from Central America who were refugees often based in, uh, when they were here in this region, El Paso, in in Las Cruces when ICE had released them as they sought to meet up with family members uh, for a few days at um, uh, local churches in Las Cruces were given some kind of uh, support. So it, is it the case then we've moved away from any notion of human rights approaches to immigration to this crimmigration approach and now we're in a mode of simply inflicting suffering and cruelty on detained migrants as a strategy of deterrence. Even the language itself um, is important to note. The term criminal aliens has become widespread in legislation, but also in the day-to-day -day language of Border Patrol agents. The word tonks, for example, is quite well known in these circles. A tonk is the sound that a flashlight makes when you hit somebody on the head. In this case, when a border patrol agent catches or attempts to catch a, an undocumented migrant at, at nighttime in one of these unhospitable crossing places in mountains or ravines. So the sound of tonk came to be used by agents to refer to the migrants themselves. So the humanity of the migrant gets reduced to the sound of the blow to the head from a um, uh, a flashlight. The word bodies instead of people is used. I heard this myself. I was able to go with students in the summer of 2018 for a tour of the ICE uh, detention center, the processing facility in El Paso. And one of the guards there was um, referring to how they had been able to transfer 35 bodies. And he wasn't referring to dead bodies, but to individuals to another detention center. Exotics is another word that we've heard used 
made by judges at, in immigration cases in El Paso. Exotics would be Guatemalan indigenous migrants because they don't speak Spanish and have some other language of their own. Snakes is a term that we've seen President Trump use in various rallies um, to refer to migrants, um, uh, to be careful with uh, who are admitted into the country because they could bite you and hurt you. So what um, all of this is building to is a naturalization or this effort to naturalize what is really a politically constructed link between criminality and immigrant communities. And that comes along with systemic racism towards Latino, Latinx communities, because after all, that's the population that's being targeted the most with this problem. So our focus in this research project isn't only with detained migrants, but also what happens to our communities on this side of the border, uh, many of which have families of mixed immigration status. But what happens when criminality and immigration status are linked together in this very politically constructed way? So part of the rationale for all the study, as I mentioned, came out of this observation that what we got was not immigration reform, in, 2000 and in the 2000s, when, whether it was under the Bush administrations or the Obama administrations, instead more border enforcement. Um, we see the increase in agents and resources occurring between 1986 and 2006, from 2000 to over 12,000. The Border Patrol budget itself going from $2 million in 1986 to 1 1.2 billion in 2006. By 2016, there were 20,000 agents around 18,000 of those located on this southern border and a $3.5 billion budget. But the abuses that we've been able to hear about directly from migrants, um, those that have been documented in the literature and the lack of accountability for these abuses is really what drives our motivation to do this research. I think it's, uh, it's very uh, necessary and this good work going on around the country and throughout Mexico also on this issue. Some of the results are really what we see in the 1990s even, and, and particularly since it's the end of what used to be called circular migration, which migrants would come for a certain period of the time, work usually often in agriculture or some sector construction, return back to their home country after Mexico, for a period of a few months when the work season had ended and then come back. That really ended, I think, in the 1990s with Operation Blockade and so on. And instead, we see this balloon effect in which you close off these main areas of transit through the urban se sectors and migrants are pushed through into these more inhospitable areas in order to be able to migrate. Um, and we've seen more than 6,000 deaths of migrants since 2000 to the present day, um, both in the desert and the Rio Grande area. The administration of um, Obama, President Obama, picked up but really on where the administration of George Bush had left off. I think this is important to note that although certainly we can say there's a ratcheting up under the Trump administration of this immigration, it's not really the start. Uh, much of the infrastructure was in place already in 2009 onwards. Um, and one of the parts of this is known as the consequence delivery system, which deliberately calls for detention as a way of trying to deter further migration. So people aren't simply being caught and taken back over, but are spending time in a detention center, as I mentioned often. There's a private for profit interest in, in having this uh, continue. Um, in 2009, Congress passed a appropriations bill uh, in the for the Department of Homeland Security, which um, created what's been known since as the bed mandate, in which 34,000 uh, beds per day must be uh, filled by ICE in order to meet that congressional mandate which gives an incentive to, again, increase the category of criminal aliens, to capture anybody on any kind of minor infraction, and that could lead to detention in one of these centers. Um, 
zero tolerance and family separation, placing children in detention. Currently in the news, we've seen there's over 500 children who cannot be reunited with their parents um, because of that policy. And at least there's this question, okay, if suffering is being used as a way of trying to deter further migration, why do people still try to cross? And I think there are two factors that most of the scholarship uh, and the testimonies that we've heard tell us. One is family reunification. People don't want to be deported and left without connections with their family or left back in the US. And also the driving factors have been worsening not only poverty and unemployment in Central American countries, but certainly the drug related violence and the cartel violence has pushed people out of their home communities. In Mexico too, Mexico's own response to asylum policy has changed in response to pressure from the United States uh, when the Trump administration threatened to increase taxes on imports from Mexico. This was a very big lever that the Mexican government felt it was unable really to do much about or decided not to do much about. And instead, a National Guard, which hadn't yet even been fully formed, was deployed at both the north border to prevent migrants from trying to cross into the United States, and particularly the southern border to try and prevent migration from Central America. Um, recently, it was reported in the media that development projects uh, in Central America some funding from those development projects uh, provided by Mexico has been used to finance detention and deportation from Mexico. Um, so again, not exactly addressing the root causes of the problem by doing that. And as I mentioned earlier, many migrants from the US, when they return to Mexico, they return to very dangerous locations without adequate infrastructure or support and often vulnerable to being recruited by criminal organizations, as the criminal organizations were seen to be the biggest beneficiaries of all of this. They are the ones who will know the routes to get across the border, a border that's increasingly closed. They are the ones with the wherewithal, financial, technological um, networks to recruit. Um, so migrants get caught in as new members of uh, cartels which raises yet another area for us to contemplate of the war on drugs and what that is producing. Um, turning to higher education and what uh, is being done, what might be done uh, regarding this big question, what we've done in this project from the start was to adopt what's known as community-based participatory research which means that the questions, the research questions have to come out of some kind of conversation or dialogue with community partners. Although we as academics may feel as though we've got our uh, finger on the pulse as it were, we read all the literature, we know what the big issues are. Um, there's really um, a great benefit in having those conversations and dialogues with people who feel that we need research on this particular problem right now. And, and because things change so fast, I think that's what we've seen during these past few summers. Things were happening so fast. The, um, the policies were coming thick and fast with huge ramifications. So to have at the get go, those conversations and figure out, okay, we generally know what the issues are, but what would be most useful at this point. And then to have those same community members evaluate the work as well, to be able to present it back to them at the end and get their feedback. Um, I think students learn greatly through conducting any kind of research. We always encourage that, I know, in what we do, but particularly if they're working in the field, they develop a habit for doing field notes each day, writing up what they have observed. And you can imagine in this environment that we're talking about the past few summers, there's been a lot of um, need to reflect and to debrief. It can be very stressful, a lot of triggers um, to observe people being shackled in courtrooms and so on. This is uh, something that allows for us to reflect on why that's happening, but how we feel about it. How, what do we do with those emotions as well as our analysis? And um, we've been able to present the results of this at the, there's an annual symposium of research experience for undergraduate programs 
there are many in the social sciences that when we went in 2018 to that, so it was great that Zyra got the opportunity to present there. And we've also presented, uh, there's a bunch of acronyms there you can see, but the Midwest Latin American Studies Association, uh, one of our students, Catherine Garcia, co-authored a piece with Dr. Slack from UTEP and presented at the American Anthropological Association. I've already mentioned the Western Social Science Association. And um, we have a proposal to present at the next Latin American Studies Association meeting in, in Vancouver next, next year. And one of the great things, I'm glad Ava's here because she's going to talk about the Consortium on Forced Migration that she's very active with at Vasa College. So we've, we've been able to build some good relationships which will hopefully continue. Um, some examples of the student projects and before I hand over to them directly, um, observing Operation Streamline in federal courts and observing the Remain in Mexico policy last year, accompanying community organizers and learning how to give Know Your Rights trainings, not only to know how the training is done, but to then give those trainings in Spanish to refugees who really need that as they set off on their bus trip or their flight to family members wherever they were located. Um, researching policies designed to give safety to asylum seekers, attending community events to raise awareness about these impacts, and as I mentioned just now, participating in some academic conferences. And this is a poster of Zaire presenting at the NSF Council on Undergrad Research in Alexandria in October 2018. And um, so here is just a very big conference of about 200 students and some faculty advisors and the NSF program director seeing some of the results. This is her poster on Operation Streamline. Um, this is a panel at the Western Social Science Association, where Zaira again with Carlos Espina and Nancy Mateo from Colby College are presenting. Um, this is a picture, sorry, Ava, I couldn't get one with your full face, but you're at this table with one of our local uh, New Mexico representatives, Angelica Rubio, last year um, with two other students, Israel Monsivais, also from NMSU, and Esperanza Hernandez from Duke talking about sanctuary policies in New Mexico. Um, we had a lot of fun. We did some field trips to Sonora, Arizona, to Ambos Nogales, uh, we celebrated when we finished the program and all work was handed in. As the slack, the tall guy in the middle there from UTEP. And that's, um, that's that. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to turn it over to our two students so they can reflect on the activities that they did, how they feel that was meaningful in terms of community impact and how it's impacted them as students themselves. So. Uh, first off is Zaira. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. Um, my name is Sara Martin, and as mentioned, I participated in the summer of 2018 REU, um, which began just a few weeks after the zero tolerance policy was announced. So at this time, there was definitely a lot of things happening in our community and across the border. Um, and this gave us the opportunity to become involved with different organizations here in our community and to um, form part of different events and protests that were happening throughout the community in response to this policy. Um, my group collaborated closely with the ACLU of Las Cruces and the ACLU Border Rights Center of El Paso, and our project mainly focused on Operation Streamline, um, which was established in, th in 2005 and in a way is a precursor to the zero tolerance policy. Um, but after the implementation of this policy, um, there was a rapid increase in the number of people subject to Operation Streamline and the charges under under Operation Streamline, which are illegal entry without inspection and illegal re-entry without inspection, um, quick, quickly became the most prosecuted crimes in the US and especially in our, in our region. Um, this definitely raised some concerns around human rights violations and due process violations that came with, you, with these mass hearings. Um, so our group focused on attending and observing these hearings and documenting any sort of what we called red flags um, which could indicate a potential violation during these streamlined hearings. Um, and these ranged from translation issues to, fam to allegations of family separation. Um, we did so in an effort to promote due process and fair treatment of, of people in our community um, 
um, in accordance to constitutional laws. Um, with this, we created a court observation manual, which encouraged the general public to go out and observe these um, prosecution, prosecutions in order to create awareness. Um, this manual included basic information about the charges and things that we would have wanted to know when we initially started and just things that we learned um, along the way. One of the things that we included that was very important to us um, was a self-care section because we felt that um, it would be very hard hitting for anyone in the community. I know it was very hard hitting for me when I first um, went into this, these hearings. Um, and as a lifelong fronteriza, I was unaware of everything that was going on in our communities. And I feel like that's the same sentiment that would go on. Um, so this was definitely a very important section of our, of our manual. Um, the second part of our project, the court observation manual, I feel was very meaningful to the ACLU who we collaborated with and to the community because this, of course, created awareness and set a foundation and led the way for anyone who wanted to go in and observe um, these hearings. And a few months after um, the project ended and the ACLU distributed the manuals, um, I kept going back maybe once a week to the hearings and there was definitely more and more people going out to observe. So I think this definitely benefited them, um, benefited our community as a whole, actually. And this project was very significant to me on a personal level, like I said, being a native to this area and as a student as well, as it was my first exposure to research. Um, and it really opened the doors to, to explore um, my interest and helped me attend all these conferences, like mentioned by Dr. Harvey, both here in El Paso and in San Diego and in Virginia. Um, and two years later, as a senior, I am now working on an undergraduate honors thesis, or at least some modified version of it, given the circumstances. And with the help of my femtor, Dr. Cynthia Vajarano and Dr. Neil Harvey, I have been able to take some of the things that I learned that summer and integrate them, um, integrate some of the concepts from my previous project to fit my undergraduate thesis. Um, and there's no doubt that this project in collaboration with my thesis um, served as a framework and as the foundation um, as I transition into graduate school now. Um, and with this, I will now leave the floor for Ava um, to share some of her experiences with the project. Great, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for having me. My name is Ava. I'm a senior history major at Vassar College, um, which is a small school in New York State. And I participated last summer, so summer 2019 in this program. Um, and so I also worked with a small group of students with Esperanza Hernandez and Israel Montivais um, with the ACLU in Las Cruces. Um, and our project had three main components. One of them was continuing the work of observing these Operation Streamline cases using that court manual that Zara talked about. Um, and so we went into those courts um, and observed those cases as often as we could. Um, and that was a really important thing that we thought we needed to continue um, and really maintain that court observation. Um, we also gave Know Your Rights presentations, as Dr. Harvey mentioned to asylum seekers and their families. Um, and this was really set up as a interactive presentation. Um, and we were really stressing the fact that you have a right to remain silent and to record your interactions with law enforcement. Um, and so it was really meaningful, I think, for us to be able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and hear their experiences and see them kind of gain confidence as they learn that they do have these rights and we got to um, you know, give these presentations to many families. So that was something that was really important to me. Um, and then the last component of this research was really looking at sanctuary city policy and imagining what that would hypothetically look like at a statewide level for New Mexico. Um, so we used Las Cruces and the broader Doniana County as our case study. Um, because Las Cruces is a welcoming community and the county is a safe community, um, we looked at the language involved in sanctuary policy um, and what the implications are for using terms like welcoming and safe, um, perhaps in place of sanctuary. Um, we also looked at the you know, major counter arguments against sanctuary, what people are concerned about, and that is public safety and federal funding. Um, and federal funding is really important because it's something that the Trump administration has repeatedly said is at risk of communities 
um, adapt sanctuary legislation or policy in any form. So we looked at those grants and what it would mean to be more transparent in how they are um, used and explained in communities. So ultimately, while we were hoping to create you know, an argument for a statewide policy, what we realized is that in order to have a really thoughtful policy and one that is implemented um, and does what it's supposed to do, there has to be you know, total um, enforcement at a local level and local communities really need to believe in this policy. So we kind of changed our argument um, and started considering sanctuary as a process and how we could explain this process um, with the goal of ultimately reaching a statewide policy. So we used Las Cruces and Doniana. We conducted 13 interviews um, with many with elected officials, um, state representatives, city councilors, uh, Sheriff Stewart. Um, we also talked to people who who work in education, superintendents of schools, professors, and a grant analyst from DHS, and really tried to imagine what the implications of sanctuary policy are and how they are done well at a small local level. And then we made a list of complementary policies. So what else can be done within the state to enhance support for sanctuary policy? And that includes continuing access to driver's licenses and alternative forms of identification, creating local fingerprint databases so local law enforcement does not need to rely on those federal resources, um, creating school policies and trainings for teachers that really emphasize the protection of their students, um, and diversifying means of economic growth within the state. So I learned a lot from this project. I think that learning these research methods like Dr. Harvey talked about was a really important experience for me to be able to bring in the skills that I have been working on gaining in my undergraduate classroom. Um, collaborative learning, asking critical questions, um, and really bringing that into this research. And in return, I've taken the experiences from this past summer back to Vassar College, where I've worked with a consortium on forced migration, displacement, and education. Um, and we have done different programs, student projects, conferences, um, teaching labs, to really talk about how higher education institutions handle questions of forced migration. Um, and that for me included last summer, co-curating an exhibit on the US-Mexico border wall and how local students, artists, and activists are responding to what is happening along the border right now. So I'm very grateful to be able to share all of this today with you all. Um, and I believe there may be some room for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Zyra. Thank you, Ava. Um, I, I appreciate um, your participation very much and all of the students who participated in this project so far. Um, we've been 10 in each of those summers of 2018, 2019. We'd already selected 10 for 2020 before COVID hit, and we kept those same 10. So we were working with some uh, right now online and different projects. Um, and hopefully next summer, depending on the situation, we'll be able to resume some of that work in the field. Um, so 30 students altogether, undergrads have participated in it. And it's great to see the other work that you're doing. Besides this, it, it's really very uh, inspiring. So thank you. So um, I get that there are some questions. I'm going to ask uh, David if you could help us with the question bit. Of course, of course. Uh, thank you, uh, Neil. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Saira. Uh, the three of you had done an amazing work at painting this really dehumanizing picture of what is happening at our immigration policies in the United States and the problems and the inhumane conditions that our migrants have to suffer uh, more and more in this country. We have a, a, a host of questions actually that are really, really interesting. Uh, two of them that we, one of them that I might be able to answer really quickly, another one that it's homework for the three of you. Uh, and, um, and then three questions that we will, three, four questions that hopefully, or five that we will answer live depending on time. 
Um, so the one that is for me that I can answer really quickly is, will this webinar be recorded and made available? The answer is yes. Uh, we are recording this webinar. If you didn't get a chance to see it all, if you didn't get a chance to, to come today, if you want to spread it to anyone else, um, it will be recorded. It will be available uh, through CLAB's website, the Center for Latin American and Border Studies website. Uh, and that is uh, claps.nmsu.edu. We will probably have it up in, in a day or so. It'll be there on our events tab you can see the whole Zoom recording. So that's easy for me to answer. Um, we'd love that you would go and see it again. Um, the second one that's a homework for the three of you is uh, from Stephanie Lewis. All of, of all of the books written and recommending during prior or for this lecture, can you please compile a list for us to peruse later? So I'm gonna leave that in the three of your hands and I will make sure that I post that list in our events page, also at collabs.nmsu.edu so that Stephanie and others that are interested can actually go see the list of, of particular readings. Um, so then we have a few questions and I'll do these in the order that they were asked. Uh, Vanessa Covarrubias is asking us, how long can ICE hold an immigrant? Um, so on this, it, it, unfortunately, it, it's very vague. And uh, what we're seeing is that detention is going on much longer than um, would be normal under circumstances. And often this is in, contingent on the ability of detained migrants to obtain um, bond for release. Um, this depends how high the bond is set. But that seems to be one of the more determining factors on the length of detention that we're, that we're observing here. I think that really needs to be addressed in, uh, in legislation. Um, part of the problem is, I believe, the incentive from the um, run detention centers, they contract with ICE to run them, is to keep more migrants detained uh, as long as possible and to keep those centers uh, full. So that uh, both those factors, the inability often of um, detained migrants to obtain bond and also the um, incentive from the private corporation side to keep people detained get really in the way of what would be a more sensible approach, I believe, and certainly a human rights approach to this and to release on the basis of, uh, of an alternative of being able to wait for a hearing from within one's own community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Neil. Um, we have another question. This is in Spanish, so I'm going to translate. I'm going to do it both in Spanish and translate. Uh, this comes from Amalia Canseco. Si México ha aumentado el parar la migración y qué impacto ha tenido esto? So, it, has Mexico done anything to try to stop migration? And if so, what impact has this had on the lives of migrants in the US and the policies? Um, yeah, I mentioned in my presentation, and maybe, I don't know, Ava or Zaira, if you'd like to add to this, that um, the, the history of this is Mexico for the longest time had a policy of no policy on migration. That's how it was referred to often in discussions of this um, because migration from Mexico to the United States actually helped um, the Mexican economy with the remittances that were returned and it relieved pressure on already limited labor market within Mexico. Um, so there was no real attempt from the Mexican government to prevent migrants from leaving. Um, that, of course, has um, evolved now to a situation where in 2019, the Trump administration uh, put pressure on Mexico, Mexico's governments and the new governments of Lopez Obrador to um, deploy National Guard units, um, law enforcement, Mexican law enforcement along the northern border 
at those places where migrant caravans who had assembled from Central America had made their way through Mexico were seeking to enter. You may recall some of that in the news. So the Mexican government has taken a very proactive approach in now in trying to prevent uh, migration into the United States, largely because of that economic uh, leverage that the US is the largest market for Mexican exports, around 80% of Mexican exports go to just the United States. So having an, an increase on tariffs would be very damaging. I know at the southern border is something, Zaira, you're looking at in your honors thesis. Would you like to share what you're seeing there? What's happening in Mexico's southern border with Guatemala? Yes, of course. Um, like Dr. Harvey mentioned, my initial undergraduate honors thesis was based on um, mirroring policies on how Mexico has adopted some of the policies that the U.S. has adopted over the years. Um, one of the most recent ones is with the use of the National Guard um, being deployed. First, we saw it on Mexico's northern border, and um, my thesis was wanting to find out how that has been reflected on the southern border and the effects that it has had on the community. Um, because I know living in the in in the border my whole life, um, these these effects, these militarization militarization effects have kind of been normalized. And I was just curious on how um, the community specifically in Chiapas uh, felt around the militarization of the borders and how Mexico has adopted and reused some of the anti-immigrant policies um, that the US has used and implemented them on the southern border to prevent um, people from Central America transiting through Mexico. Ava, yeah. add anything? Um, I think I think that explanation is what I, you know, what I was going to add. But um, I think the one thing that we realized um, when we've been doing this research is that this is research on things that are constantly evolving and constantly changing. And so there is an element of this work, which is, you know, both studying what has happened and reacting somewhat to what has happened, um, but trying to imagine alternative paths forward. Um, and so I think this conversation is very much in line with the conversations we had doing our research and you know what's happening. Do we have any idea what's going to happen next and how can we best incorporate that into our work? Thanks. Thank you. As, as both a Mexican by birth, a Mexican American by choice and a Southwest border resident by heart, it, is, it pains me to, to know that Mexico keeps mirroring these strategies and criminalizing migrants. Um, okay, so we have uh, several more questions. So hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, this is um, one from Cynthia Weiss. What is the likelihood this program might be expanded to graduate level students? Are there classes that a, stu uh, a student at NMSU might take in the coming semesters that would include information like this? Um, as for classes, we do have a lot of classes that include information like this, both in, in uh, Dr. Harvey's uh, Department of Government and my own department in sociology, we offer immigration classes, uh, Latin American immigration, Mexican immigration classes, race and ethnicity classes in sociology. Uh, Dr. Harvey, you might want to uh, talk about some of the classes that, that are offered at NMSU in your department and in other departments. Uh, Sure, yeah, and in our departments in government, we have a class on US-Mexico government policy, um, which I've been teaching both undergrad and grad level. Um, and one really exciting um, thing we're working on together, I have a colleague, Dr. Sabina Hirschauer, in my department who has taken students on a, uh, the same summers as we were doing this for part of the summers. She was taking students to do service learning projects in, in Germany on the migrant crisis in Europe. And those students, when they came back, met with the students like Zyra and others who are involved here to share experiences and thoughts and make some comparisons between responses in, in Germany to the migrant crisis there and to the US-Mexico border. Um, our goal is to kind of build with that and go back to the NSF and get funding to really build a comparative project as well both for undergrads and grad students. This really is undergrad because that's where the project uh, that the NSU, uh, NSF had going, the REU, seemed very propitious for this. 
Um, but certainly I'd be interested in discussing graduate level opportunities too. Thank you. Um, uh, this question is from Stephanie Arnett. I am especially interested in a uh, way that language is at work here. How has your research team seen, seen instances of people who are part of the bureaucracy of crimigration resisting the dehumanizing language? For example, referring to living human beings as bodies, exotics, etc. cetera. Um, how have they used uh, this language or, or resist this, the use of this language um, by their colleagues, right? Are, are people within the structure resisting this? And if so, what strategies do they use to do so? Do new ICE agents, for example, initially resist this language? How does this look in the courts? And finally, uh, are those who do not use this dehumanizing language as ostracized or treated differently within the system? Uh, those are great questions, and it goes to the heart of the cultural politics of crimigration. Uh, thank you for raising those questions. It's not something we've really um, deliberately focused on, and so I don't really have good answers, but uh, something I'd be really interested in, in knowing more about. Um, I think uh, the sites in which we've been, such as immigration courts, are good places to observe the language that's used. The words such as exotics was used by a immigration judge quite frequently. I didn't see any of the other members of the court objecting much to that. And what was kind of disheartening um, was in the breaks in between sessions, they'd be joking about that amongst themselves. So not a lot of pushback there. I'm sure in other instances there is, but. I don't really have enough to go off. Maybe Zyra or Ava in places where you were, did you see any alternative ways of talking about migrants? So I can speak a little bit on the federal courts. Um, for the most part, Border Patrol agents were not present during the hearings. Um, it was very limited hearings to where there was actually a Border Patrol um, President. However, I would like to highlight that this language um, is not only adopted by agents, however, um, even the attorneys, the, the public defenders would refer to, to people as criminal aliens. Um, the judge would refer to them as criminal aliens. So I think this, this sort of language has, has evolved to not only be adopted by um, law enforcement officials and border patrol, but um, all the entities that are involved in, in the criminalization of immigrants. Um, I can add that, you know, my research on sanctuary cities, although it wasn't, we weren't looking specifically at language used um, to refer to people and their experiences, we were looking at language um, within policy. Um, and there, are, we had a variety of different reactions to that. Some people said, you know, people are scared of using the word sanctuary, but we should do that because that's the strongest statement we can make. Um, and some people said we could have similar policy um, and that would have similar effects if we use words such as welcoming community and safe community um, without having to run the risk of highlighting ourselves as a sanctuary city. Um, and so I think that debate over language and who's using it is was relevant to a lot of our different research. Um, but I, yeah, I agree. I remember some of what Zara was saying in the federal courts. Um, I don't think I have much to add there, but I know that language was something that was very relevant to the research we were doing. Thank you all. Um, we have um, a question that's been repeated by two different uh, um, uh, participants, uh, um, Judith Flor Flores Carmona and Manal Hamsa. Thank you both for, for asking uh, this important question. Um, and it revolves around sanctuary campuses. Um, so the, the general question, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna ask each of the questions uh, in particular, but I'm, I'm rephrasing a little bit here. Uh, but basically the gist of it is with NMSU being an HSI, MSI university and being part of the community, uh, uh, having DACA, uh, documented and undocumented students, are border universities working on becoming sanctuary campuses? Why or why not? Or are we part of the efforts to make NMSU a sanctuary campus um, and if so, what are some of these efforts? 
I can um, talk to that briefly. I know that um, those of you all at NMSU probably have more updated information, um, but we, my group did speak with some professors at NMSU who were involved with some efforts to talk about sanctuary campus status, um, particularly following the 2016 election and kind of the process that led to ultimately more support and awareness and conversations for students and particularly undocumented students at NMSU. Um, though to my knowledge, it's not formally a sanctuary campus, um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, that was definitely something that's part of the conversation and, and universities that are closer to the border, different things to discuss when we're having those conversations versus universities that may be a little bit further. So, oh, go ahead, Neil. No, I, I just think it, yeah, it is important for NMSU to have those conversations and to, and it, it shows that um, we would certainly be supportive of students affected by um, efforts to encroach on the campus life and students' life, that we care for all students, that we're not here to collaborate with federal immigration on this question. I think there's um, uh, a role here for, um, for administration and faculty to extend the, um, the knowledge of the big problems and how our students face this. It's yet another layer of, of uh, stress. And uh, I think we have really a, a good role to play in leading this effort. And hopefully that is something that will come out. I, I believe without knowing all the details that our own faculty Senate is going to be um, bringing this up for discussion. So hopefully it will be some good, good movement. Uh, yes, I uh, both uh, Dr. Brown and I, I think are co-sponsors of a bill <laughs> in the NMSU faculty Senate that is proposing that exact thing. Uh, Dr. Brown, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or we currently have a bill that's being considered a memorial requesting New Mexico State University self-declare as a sanctuary campus within the Senate infrastructure here, when the faculty Senate makes a memorial or making a statement in an area where we don't have direct authority to do anything, curriculum we have an authority, a memorial like this we don't. That bill is currently moving through the Senate. Um, as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, he and I are both um, co-sponsors, and I will paste a link into the chat that has the current bill posted. Um, if anyone from NMSU is interested in joining the bill or learning about it, please contact Dr. Ortiz or me, and I hope that it serves as a model for other institutions. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a lot more questions, and we're running out of time. Um, here are a couple of others that I'm going to try to, to, to push us through. Um, um, one in Spanish uh, from Lucila Canseco, I'm going to try to translate. Is it possible that all of these uh, migrant policies that are so strong can change if there is a change in the president of the United States? Um, again, that's a great question. Um, what I began saying in the first part of the presentation was what the Trump administration has done has really ratcheted up. Certainly, we've got plenty of examples of this, but many of these policies were already evolving or in place under the Obama and Biden as Biden's vice president. Um, we recall that um, the, the very high level of deportations in that period, this um, focus on um, the most criminal elements as a target or whatever, um, priority enforcement program came in really at the end and still many people were being deported as they crossed the border. So a lot of work I think needs to be done. I wouldn't take it for granted. Um, in very brief comments, I've seen that uh, candidate Biden has said that in the first 100 days, he would send a bill for a comprehensive immigration reform. 
that would include 11 million undocumented as well as all the DACA student, DACA youth um, as a path to citizenship, which I think is, is necessary and hopefully would you know, gain that kind of support. Um, depends, I think, also on the Senate. You know, if uh, if uh, there is support in the Senate for these measures, then then that would be helpful. Um, depends, you know, what happens with the vote there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it still depends on civil society of uh, the immigrant immigrant communities, their organisations, uh, in making the case still that. And we need a human rights approach to immigration. And uh, my fear sometimes with um, federal governments is that they may say, in order to get this path to legalization, we have to increase border security, which is exactly what's happened before several times now. And we don't get one, but we get the other. Um, so I guess we need to you know, take some lessons from 2000 and uh, nine, uh, when the Obama administration came in for the first time and had um, Congress on its side, but dropped immigration reform. Um, had you know good reasons, perhaps. Um, the economy was in deep recession, healthcare reform was vital. Um, but now we may have the same situation. COVID-19 will probably be the priority, the econ economy, so immigration reform, again, may not make it to the front burner, but I would hope on things like um, asylum policy, release of people from ICE detention into alternatives, all of that uh, could be done and should be done. Thank you, Neil. As a, as a social movement scholar, I want to echo what Neil said, which is civic participation, civic involvement will be vital on this. So if, you're, if this is something that interests you, participate, uh, do anything you can to get involved. Um, we have three more questions. I know that we've run out of time, but um, um, I've uh, talked to the people at NMSU Webinar Services to let us extend our, our stay for a little bit so that we can answer all of your questions. So if you're interested in hearing some of these answers, uh, please stay with us for a few more minutes. Um, Jill Schwenning asks, Separating children from their families, keeping humans in cages, the deplorable conditions in those detention centers, including the threat of COVID-19, are all clear human rights violations. Has the UN said anything about our horrible behavior as a country, our clear violation of human rights, and denying asylum to those who need it, or try to sanction the US for this? Um, I'll be brief, because I know we're brief on time, and, and uh, uh, I would say I, I recall uh, there have been attempts earlier before the Trump administration of the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights um, visiting and really not getting full cooperation. This was during the Bush, the second Bush administration and visiting some of these centers. That was then. Um, right now, the UN is making uh, its own its human rights section does make declarations, but its ability to observe directly is as limited as uh, is for most people. And that's one of the problems of how do we uh, hold um, our government institutions accountable if access is so restricted and if data is not being provided. Um, I don't know, Ava or Zaira, would you like to add to that one quickly? I think uh, largely the UN has been more involved or discussions going on at the UN level to create a new, what they call a global compact on migration, which really addresses this from a human rights perspective and looks at the root causes much more than uh, domestic policy is prepared to do. So that'd be somewhere to look into. And, and, and several years, ago, many years ago, maybe a decade ago, there was this task force created at the UN on the human rights of migrants uh, that has largely been it seems forgotten, right? There's not much activity on that, but maybe it's a, a, a good point to start restarting those conversations. Uh, two more questions and then we're done. Um, Marisa Mancillas asks, I am a new graduate student at NMSU in the range and animal science department. I study plants. 
How can non-social scientists incorporate an awareness of immigration and human rights issues as we work on ecological areas along the US-Mexico border? Um, I'll just say two things for being brief. One is the impact of the construction of border fencing and border wall on the ecosystems along the US-Mexico border. It's very negative impacts that have been documented. That would be of interest to you. Another is to look at some of the driving factors of migration now in Central America are related to climate change and drought in rural areas. Um, people are unable to maintain levels of uh, subsistence in, in traditional farming communities that is also being documented. I know Zaira and Ava. Um, I think there's a lot to look at in, like you said, Dr. Harvey, um, at climate change migration. Um, and migration that's a result of our changing climate and changing environments. Um, so that's also what I thought of. Um, to echo some of what Dr. Harvey mentioned, I think that um, particularly in this region, the geological impact is very important as um, we see wildlife and, and plants being affected by the, the implementation of the border wall. And we often seem to think that um, migration and immigration is just um, limited to a discipline of like social sciences and, and all that. But I think it's very interesting and very important that, that you highlighted that um, even something as like geological sciences can be impacted by something like migration. Thank you so much. Uh, last question we will have, and it's in Spanish, so I'm going to translate from Alejandro Ortiz. Um, uh, understanding the terrible violence and criminalization towards immigrants uh, just for the fact of being an immigrant, is there a, a larger plan to stop these kinds of, of policies? Uh, is there an, a, a type of inter, intention or creation of a system, perhaps a binational system, that goes more or beyond just immediate kind of stopgap solutions? Uh, perhaps a, a way to, to have a binational plan with the United States and Mexico together to try to uh, 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 resolve this migra migration issue and, and especially the violence and criminalization that goes with it. Yeah, unfortunately there isn't and that's what we need, I believe. And I think the results of our project building on results of many other writings on this topic point in that direction that is a real need. Um, the, uh, the only things that I've seen, for example, are, for example, with regard to detention centers and the terrible treat mistreatment that goes on there, and we've heard about a lot, um, the ICE itself has a document. It's a performance-based national detention standards. It drew up at the behest of Congress. Um, it is inspected by the um, uh, Department of Homeland Security's um, uh, accountability office, but nothing ever comes from it. No private detention center has been closed down. So it's a matter, I think, of political will as well as crafting the policies. And as you say, the binational part would be wonderful, um, but that has not occurred. What we get instead binationally is um, Mexico adopting what the U.S. administration is demanding on pain of tanking its economy. That is that is regretful. Um, on that not very hopeful note, though, <laughs> we have to close uh, our seminar. Our time is over. I want to thank our three panelists, uh, Dr. Neil Harvey, Ms. Ava McElhone Yates, and Ms. Saida Martin, for a wonderful uh, talk this evening. I want to work, uh, thank you, thank uh, Dr. Chris Brown for uh, co-sponsoring this event. I want to thank our graduate assistant, Yvette Navarro, for helping us field all of your questions. She was very hard at work uh, today. I want to thank NMSU Webinar Services for uh, putting this, uh, helping us put this webinar together. And on behalf of the Center for Latin American and Border Studies and myself, David Ortiz, I thank you for being all here, for participating, for your very engaging questions. Uh,
follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook. We will have a lot of these events and we would love that you participate on them. Um, these types of events with questions and, and participation from the community is what makes NMSU a fantastic place to be in the border region. Um, so thank you very, very much. Uh, we appreciate all you coming. Muchas gracias por venir to those of, of, of you that participated in Spanish. Gracias por estar aquí. Um, up to, uh, we'll see you in the next event. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much.